Show Mrebyug. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Sure Look, Sure Listen, the podcast that takes a pop at culture. Sure Look, Sure Listen. 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 Oh, very good, Ben. Benjamin, sure, look, this week we're taking a look at Scarlett Johansson, who's decided to take a leaf out of my book and sue her overlords at Disney. And not only that, Ben, but also we have seen two vil- films of greatly varying quality. <laughs> sure, listen, Michael, if that wasn't enough, we're going to be taking a look at a tiny little gem of a toxic trope that really irritates people after a certain reason why. And if you ever find yourself... Uh, looking at a television show and saying, I don't like this as much as I used to. Why mm. is that? Well, we mm. might have the answer on this week's podcast because oh, we're looking good. at flanderization. Oh, I thought it was going to be racism. Benjamin, <laughs> I put up a quick poll on the Discord there recently. And I have to say, Ben, on the Discord, I asked, what do people really love about the podcast? And what they said is, what we really love is being involved in little in-jokes that take place off the podcast and we have no way of understanding. So for that very reason, we will be referring to you as old floppy fingers collopy for the rest of this episode. <laughs> oh, no. Boo. Boo. All right, old um, floppy fingers, why don't you tell us what's going on with Scarlett Johansson? What is wrong with her? Why are her knickers, Ben, as they say, in a twist? Uh, so in this particular case, Michael um, Benjamin, uh, yes, I take a bit of issue with that uh, misogynistic turn of phrase you use there. I have to say, in my particular case, no, the uh, the knickers in a twist thing. I don't think that's you, you said that, buddy. Mm, no, that that wasn't I? me. Oh, that wasn't I? me. I mean, we can we can reverse the tape. Let's re-roll the tape. <laughs> we could go back over the tape. So, Michael, the reason for that particular uh, kerfuffle. The reason for that particular kerfuffle is that Disney's premier access mode, the greediest corporate move since... Corporations. Since corporations, uh, where we charge subscribers even more money for access to a film that's going to be coming out in cinemas anyway, or maybe not, depending on how long a pandemic runs for. Um, Premier access released uh, Disney's Black Widow to a $21.99 here in the Old Republic of Ireland uh, extra fee to the song of twenty one ninety nine to get access to it, and apparently, Michael, yes, one Scarlett Johansson. I've heard of her. I've seen some of her films. Yes, she's 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 an independent actress of some some small fame, some merit. Um, yes, she apparently had struck a deal with Marvel that that right. wouldn't happen because within her contract, Michael, she is yes. entitled to a certain percentage of box office earnings. Okay. Okay. Now, what she alleges, Michael. Now, Ben, I'm going to cut across you here. What she alleges or what her legal team allege? What her legal team alleges. Fair. Yes. Good Good work, Michael. Good work. She might sue us next if I get this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love, Ben, if after all of your years of pining, <laughs> your first ever contact with Scarlett Johansson was her suing you. Hang on, I find Scarlett Johansson to be a thoroughly dull actress. And we've oh my god, several times double suit. The podcast. Double, <laughs> double suit. suit. Uh, I'm up to my eyeballs in litigation. Um, so, yes, her legal team alleges that within that contract, she's entitled to a certain uh, percentage of box office earnings. Okay. Um, due to her long-standing contract with Marvel, etc., etc., etc. And, very good, knowingly, yeah. Marvel agreed with Disney to release it on Premier Access and that it hampered her potential earnings mm. for uh, box office, which yeah. is a legitimate argument to make. Yes. Now, the internet has been Go split on. on two sides. Right. Normal people and misogynists. Oh, kind yeah. Of a, You're kind gang. of a classic internet. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a classic internet. Again, Michael, I really have to stress I'm not a misogynist. Oh, okay, right, right, um, right. That's what a misogynist would say, though. <laughs> it's theoretically what anyone would say when they were accused of being a misogynist. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, what happened here, Michael, is that um, the internet kind of got hold of this, and there's a bunch of people saying, she's already rich, who cares? Um, you know, she should be grateful to have the role that she has, she should be grateful for the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney didn't really help themselves, Michael, because they released a statement. Right. Now, hold on, Ben. You haven't really um, provided a counter-argument to that. 
to the the fact that she's not it's it's a my my counter argument to all of this michael is that it's not a personal issue at all this is a this is a business matter yeah this is a yeah, breach yeah, yeah. of contract on disney's part is it um though? well i mean that's what the legal battle will determine michael i, I haven't seen either of the contracts mm. or the agreements i don't know the background to this deal all i know is scarlett johansson is taking disney to court or scarlett johansson's legal team or Scarlett Johansson's legal team. Has has Madame Scarlett Johansson herself been the woman who put the miss into misogynist? Has she? Um, has she? That's not true. I just like the sound of it. Has she? Has she said anything? She hasn't. She oh, okay. has not spoken okay. right, um, right. in any regard to that. Now, Disney then, in response to this, yeah, um, kerfuffle. And that's not going to call it, Michael. I'm going to keep calling call it a kerfuffle, kerfuffle yeah. because I like that. Uh, it, they have released a statement, and ooh wee, Michael, ooh wee, yeah. talk about talk about missing the mark. Now, Benjamin, <laughs> this statement is from Disney. Is that correct? Yes. I feel it is only so, fitting for you to read this statement in the voice of Disney's biggest icon, Mickey Mouse. Okay. Well, in that case, Michael, give me two seconds. All right. I gotta, you I gotta... you work on that. <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> there is no merit whatsoever to this finding. The lawsuit is especially sad and distressing in its callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Take there that, Disney. Go. We stuck it to them. Benjamin. There you go. Yeah. You've, you've said that that's quite ham-fisted. Uh, I don't see that it is, to be honest. Oh, well, it's not up to you and what you see, Michael, because everybody else... Right. <laughs> everybody on. else has taken an issue with this. So... Um, what we've dealt with here, first of all, the the, the initial reaction to this, Michael, from almost everybody, well, is that almost everybody uh, except, for example, me. <laughs> almost everybody of importance, right? Go on. Um, <laughs> I got you. Um, so almost everybody of importance has taken issue with this because they think it's a little bit strange that they're trying to pin, you know, the insensitivity insensitivity to the the global pandemic. Hmm. Um, on, you know, Scarlett Johansson. They don't think that's really... Because they don't... A lot of people have argued that, you know, it's, it's not exactly threatening people <laughs> to, you know, go out and watch the film. They're not asking people to risk their lives or anything like that. And they didn't think that Scarlett Johansson really exhibited any callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. But, I mean, this borderline has nothing to do with Scarlett Johansson. This is two teams yeah. of... This is two... Le like, maybe Scarlett Johansson will come out and say something. Didn't something similar happen with Gal Gadot and Wonder Woman in 1984? I don't know. Didn't practically um, the same thing happen, but isn't this essentially two legal teams battling over whether or not COVID-19 disruption to business counts as a reason to break, breach contracts or not? Yeah, isn't that's, that that's essentially what this is? Yeah, and, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I feel like yeah, go on. I feel like a similar case is rolling out across multiple industries at the moment. Oh, where, for sure. You know, employers have pushed a boundary based on a COVID argument and employees have suffered or employees have pushed an argument based on a COVID, uh, you know, position. And I, I think we're going to see a lot of this in, in every industry now. Where it's yeah, like, certainly. Well, was that an ethical yeah, yeah, stance yeah. to take for sure. the pandemic? I, I see it as, like, I have no great, like... The, the massive profit-making Disney Corporation can go suck an egg as far as I'm concerned. Give, yeah, give, give her money. But it's not really Scarlett Johansson's money. It, this is essentially the Scarlett Johansson Corporation battling yeah. the Disney Corporation. This yeah, isn't exactly. like someone who works in a supermarket <clears throat> who had their hours cut during COVID or worked hours and now isn't getting paid for them. This is Scar the, the industry behind Scarlett Johansson wanting to yeah. make the most of the industry behind Disney making the most of it. So I know what you're saying of, um, oh, she didn't, she's a multimillionaire. I don't care. I mean, well, I didn't say that. I have well, no Well, you did a funny I, voice when, no, you were saying, you were mocking people who were saying yes, that. Yes, I was mocking people who did Attributing say that. a funny yes. voice to them. But yes. I'm not saying that Scarlett Johansson's a multimillionaire, so I don't care. I'm saying that this appears to be the Scarlett Johansson Corporation, who, which yes. is a multi million dollar corporation. Uh, versus the Disney Corporation, which is a multi-billion dollar corporation. And I don't really care which of them wins. I much more care that uh, local businesses get to reopen and keep all their 
all their employers, <laughs> yeah. all their employees exactly. uh, employed. So yeah, I mean, I know you were you were mocking people who weren't un un unreservedly backing Scarlett Johansson, and I I unreservedly back Scarlett Johansson the person, but I couldn't yes. care less if the Scarlett Johansson Johansson industry beats the Disney Corporation. So there's been another wave of kind of response to this, Michael. Go on. Um, and it's it's taken on, um, I suppose what's, um, uh, how Go do on. I phrase this? I don't know. Probably this happened, insensitively. This happened two last year with um John Krasinski. Go on. And a Quiet Place two. Yeah. Um, we didn't hear anything about that. Oh, very good because it was a quiet place. He took <laughs> very good. He took um Fox to court right. over um loss of earnings on a quiet place too. Right. Because the the release was delayed and then it was streamed instead of released in, in the box office. No both. Actually. None of none of that was published and none of it saw the level of pushback that this has, which has led to accusations of sexism in Hollywood um, and things like that. And in response to that, and yes. in response to Disney's uh, um, statement, there's been a joint statement issued by um, Reframe, WIF, which is Women in Film, and Time's Up. It's a, a coalition of... The, um, the anti-Harvey Weinstein alle allegiance. Yeah, I suppose you could call it that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they've they've issued a statement on it as well. Uh, While we take no position on the business issues in the litigation between Scarlett Johansson and the Walt Disney Company, right. following yeah. many common sense approaches, yeah. we stand firmly against Disney's recent statement, which attempts to characterize Johansson as an insensitive or selfish uh, for defending her contractual business rights. Now that's fine. Yeah, I, uh, is that the yeah. statement that you read out? Uh, so this is the I'm, I'm reading the statement as as we speak. No, but the statement um, that they're referring to is referring to the statement earlier that you did in the Mickey Mouse. Yes, voice. sorry, the statement I did in Mickey Mouse voice. Yes, I think Mickey it, Mouse Ben statement. Then I'm sorry for getting all litigious here, but I think it could be argued that that there's nothing in that statement which appears aimed at Scarlett Johansson, rather than aimed at Scarlett Johansson's legal team. Yeah, I, I think that's probably fair. But Michael, the second part of this statement oh, here from we go. Reframe yeah. Women in Film and Times of This gendered character attack has no oh. place in a business dispute and contributes to an environment in which women and girls are perceived to be less able than men to protect their own interests without facing ad hominem criticism. What gen what's gendered about it? I don't know. That's mm. the that, that's the thing. Mm. Right? That's the thing. Mm. And do you know? Do you know what makes it really strange is even discussing this on the podcast makes me a little bit nervous because I feel like I'm doing something wrong. Oh. And question whether or not that's a, uh -oh. <laughs> which is really interesting. Well, I um, mean, I feel I feel exactly the same way about it as I would feel about it if if John Krasinski had, like, I mean, imagine that this was aimed at John Krasinski's legal team. There's no merit whatsoever yeah. in this filing. The lawsuit is especially sad and distressing. This callous. You've scrolled off it when I was reading it. You sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry. <laughs> callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged effects of scrolling away from a quote when someone's reading it live on a podcast. <laughs> that was excellent. Good segue. Thank you. Well, Michael. I suppose the only other thing to say here is that it's opened the floodgates a little bit. Go on. Um, because Emma Stone is now considering legal action for loss of earnings on Cruella. Emma Stone or Emma Stone's legal team? <laughs> Emma Stone. I don't know. Okay. Um, I think it Emma matters. I really, really think it matters because... I, I think it. I think you're probably right, Michael, I, but I think that's exactly why we have these I think debates it's on very, podcasts. I think it's a very dangerous thing to do. And I think it is the, that is the situation where... I think sexism could come into it where we have to distinguish between the the person and the person as an industry and yeah like sexist or sex sexism or not sexism Scarlett Johansson's legal team is probably mostly men probably mm, I like, that's that's how that I, I can't possibly I mean speak uh, to I that. might be by I might not know the details there but I would imagine I, like, I don't... Who made the decision to file this lawsuit? Has this lawsuit ever even been filed? I'm not sure. But, um... I think it has. No, I, I think it's... They're, they're officially taking them to and court. Like, uh, Emma Stone is definitely... Emma Stone or Emma Stone's legal team is definitely considering their options. Yeah. Um, You'd be mad not to. But... Yeah, but one of my favourite things, Michael, is that Jared Butler... Oh, no. Jerry Butler, he can do no wrong. 
So I'm sure this is Jared Butler's personal decision and it has nothing to do with his legal <laughs> team because he's a strong, independent man. Now, that was sarcasm, Jared Ben. Butler. I'm going to point that out just in case anyone's confused. Jared Butler is taking the the company that made Olympus Has Fallen yeah. in 2013 yeah. to court Good. over loss of earnings. Good. Even though he's made two more films within that franchise with the same production company. Yeah, that is weird. Two sequels came out after that. I've, yeah, I've seen and heard of them. Was it Jared uh, Butler though, or was it his legal team? This is why I mean, you have yeah. a legal team. It's your legal team's job, Ben, to get you the most money possible. Yeah, I, I, I think fundamentally, Michael, what's happening here is that um, a lot of entertainers, a lot of actors see a huge threat in the streaming model that Disney is presenting. Well, I, I, I'm... Go on. Go on. No, you go on. I, I think it's a concerted effort to make sure that streaming doesn't permanently sideline box office percentages. It will, Ben. It bloody will. And yeah, so is it, is it a matter of, like, King David sitting at the tide going, back ocean, back, yeah. get back. No, That's I think he work. was the one who killed that giant, Ben. Ben, with a stone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay, who was the one who pushed the ocean back? I, I, look it it was, I think it was Moses, Ben. <laughs> no, Moses parted the sea, you Same tosser. thing. Ben. Um, yeah, this is the same thing that happened in the music industry fifteen years ago, and yeah, and true. you know, it's this is the this is the fear of change, and let it be he who adapts best to the change, be he or she or they who most benefit from it financially, basically. So all we can really hope is that it doesn't end up everything end um, end up in the hand of one or two multi billion dollar conglomerates. So um, next on the Box Clever podcast, the podcast that takes a look at box office happenings. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are we going to? Uh, what are we going to talk about next, Michael? Benjamin, because <laughs> we've just spent sixteen minutes of our podcast. Yeah, that's probably too much. Office. That's probably too much. Box Clever would be a great name for another podcast. Probably already taken. Benjamin. Oh damn it! Speaking what? of things which are neither in cinemas nor clever, I've watched the film Jolt. <laughs> oh god! I tell you what, so though, it's no good. Oh, me and my me and my good lady friend Michael saw the trailer for this. I've heard of her, Ben. There. I've seen her. Uh, yeah, you've heard of her. You've seen her. Um, me and my good lady friend, we we noticed this on the Amazon Prime, you know, flick through, and we went, "What? What's that? Is that Kate Beckinsale?" Kate Beckinsale. And we clicked, uh, and we, we, we clicked on it, Michael. And the most shocking thing about the Joel trailer is that the supporting cast is phenomenal. Incredible. The Stanley Tucci <laughs> is in it. Stanley Tucci, Susan Sarandon. Susan Sarandon, your favourite actor and mine, Jai Courtney. Jai Courtney, who, everybody's favourite Jai Courtney. Who I've we'll seen twice this week. <laughs> I've seen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there's Kate Beckinsale. Kate Beckinsale's in it, Ben. Benjamin. But Michael, is she a superhero? What is she? She's a lady, Ben. And she yeah. has anger management issues. She has too much or too little cortisol. And it makes her lose the rag at a moment's notice. And does it make her a superhero? No, she's not a superhero. She's um she's a person who has anger management issues and because she has anger management issues, she's like spent her whole life looking for ways to deal with the anger management issues, so she's acquired a set of skills. But she's very much not a superhero. Okay. Benjamin, if I yeah. were to compare this to anything, okay. it would be the film Crank. Yeah, because that's what I saw when I looked at it. I went, oh, they've made Crank again. Yeah, with it's Lady Kate Crank, Beckinsale. Ben. It's, it's lady crank, crank, but with ladies. Yeah. And it's not very good, unfortunately. Um, oh. It, uh, Crank's, or maybe it's Crank 2. Crank 2 had the conceit, Ben. I don't know if you remember, but he got an artificial heart and he had to keep shocking yes. himself to keep going. Was it was that Crank Two no, High Voltage? Crank that Two was High crank Voltage. Two yes. High Voltage. Yeah. yeah. Very famous. Because I love the Crank films, Michael. I unapologetically love those films. Have they aged well? No. God, no. no, no, God, no. <laughs> Misogynist <laughs> favorites, the Crank films. The Crank films, but they're a heck of a ride. They they're, are. They're they great are. Little. There's creative camera work. There's like high intent. They keep that pace, Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and they shouldn't be able to, but they do. They keep their pace and they keep their tone. Although the tone between the two cranks is quite different. Crank one is yes. like a, crank one is a high action kind of to hell with the rules action film, and crank two is purposefully absurd. Yes, uh, this one is more like crank one, but she has this. Okay. 
electronic vest thing that can give her an electric shock that stops her from losing her temper. So, oh. you know, her whole gimmick is a way to prevent action scenes from happening. Hmm. Which makes the tone of it and the pace of it a little bit odd. That's not really what you want, though, it, is it, in an action film? It's not ideal in an action film. Um, yeah. And then, unfortunately, Kate Beckinsale is a, a very good leading lady in action films, Ben. You know, she's done a lot of B-movie action films over the years. Underworld. Underworld, Ben. Underworld, Underworld 2. Two. Yeah, Underworld Revelations. Underworld 3. No, she wasn't in Underworld 3. That was Rona Mitra. Underworld 4. Yeah, she Bill was. Bill yeah. back. Un- Underworld Blood War. Um, you know, she'll be in a film. And she's nearly 50, Ben, is Kate Beckinsale. And Get she, out of town. She still looks ever convincing, doing a flip and a kick and doing a head scissors on a man. That's all well, that's fine. Good. Her love interest, Ben, in this is Jai Courtney, your favourite actor in mine, Jai Courtney. Get out of town. Full, poor man's Tom Hardy, poor, Jai Courtney. Yeah, poor man's Tom. A full 13 years younger than Kate Beckinsale. What the scandal. I was watching it, Ben, and I was thinking to myself, it's about time Hollywood sorted out these age discrepancies in relationships. <laughs> By reversing it completely. <laughs> is this what women have had to deal with for years, Ben? I don't like yeah, it. It's this is it. unpleasant. This is it. Anyway, <laughs> it's, just, it. it's just tonally all over the place. The action scenes are slow and poorly shot. Okay. And oh dear. Um, they're trying to create a... Fr- they seem to be trying to create a frenetic atmosphere, but it doesn't happen. There's one standout action scene, Ben, where a comically poorly written lady cop is chasing Kate Beckinsale through a hospital. And they end up in a maternity ward. And in order to stop the lady cop getting a good shot at her, Kate Beckinsale starts throwing babies to her. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Just Jesus picking Christ. newborns up out of cribs. And that, yeah, but that fundamentally undermines the physics of babies. You can't throw newborns around. Oh, you can. Yeah, you can. She's not throwing them at her. She's throwing them to her. So she has oh, like, to catch like, them. Like a gentle... Like a I gentle wouldn't say toss. a gentle toss, but, you know... Um, is it like a... No, it's not like, like an American football style. There's no... Sp- she doesn't put spin on the babies. There's no spin on it. She kind of lobs them. But then the and cop... is it like watching a... Is it like watching an all Ireland and Hurling final where the lady cop is like... Huh! Yeah, no, no, like no. It's, it's actually... Or? It's not shot very well, unfortunately. So it's, uh, oh, okay. it's a bit disjointed. But that is the one scene from it that will stick in my memory. Because the baby toss. The baby toss. Because that <laughs> felt like it was out of crank too. Because that's like purposefully upsetting and people are going to be going, yes. oh no, really? Is that what they did? But there's nothing else like that in the whole film. Everything else is just standard. Ben, I'll tell you right. It's set in the city. The city. It's set in, you know, the standard Kate Beckinsale where every Kate Beckinsale action film is set. The city. The city. Which city? I don't know, Ben. Some vague... I mean, there are American cops, so I guess it's in America. Is it London? Is it America? Is it it, Paris? Is it Eastern Europe? Where are you? It's Sofia, Ben. It's filmed filmed in Bulgaria, so it's Sofia. Sofia, Bulgaria. It's half Bulgaria, half sets. And it's just weird. Like every Kate Beckinsale. Not... Remember last week, Ben, when we talked about Gunpowder Milkshake and I said it was kind of a poor man's John Wick? Yes. And this is this is a poor man's crank. Yes. And yeah, it's 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 very That's unmemorable. A shame, it, though. It, it is, Ben. The central the central twist of it becomes apparent within the first fifteen minutes. What what's that now? You can do spoilers. We do spoilers. Yeah, well hang on, do you want me to come up with a No no we No, think? don't save it. We're we we do not have enough okay. we don't we'll do your song for Suicide Squad. Okay, but cool. We won't for this. Um so okay. she she thinks she's making a connection with this guy she's had a couple of dates with, Ben, played by Jai Courtney. Yeah, yeah, everybody's favourite Tom Hardy. Everybody's favourite poor man's Tom Hardy. And he is killed. Yeah. He's killed off screen. Oh. So we never see his his body. That's a shame. And that sets her up to go on a revenge rampage to to get revenge. After a couple of dates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she's a bit mad, Ben. But that sets her up to go on a revenge rampage to find the people who killed him. Do you want to guess, Ben? Do you want to guess what the twist is just from that? It... It was his da? No, Ben, it was him. He's not really dead. Oh, that's silly. He set the whole thing up, Ben, for some reason. Why? I don't know, Ben. For some reason. Just I to think he was in... a poor woman who was into him? Kind of, I think. I think he was in the CIA. He says the CIA can't operate on American soil. 
but he doesn't say that he is in the CIA or this is even happening on American soil. That's weird. It's, no, because it's happening in Sofia, Bulgaria. Yeah, it's very weird, Ben. It's all very weird. It's it's inconsistent. Kate Beckinsale is great. She has some great lines. She does some high kicks. There's a sequence, Ben, where she where she heads into a building. She gets captured by the head of security. Oh, and she yeah. gets strapped into a torture chair. And then she kind of negotiates her way out of that situation. Um, oh, that's good. Then breaks back into the building. And then ends up back in that chair 20 minutes later. That's a weird choice. It's a very weird choice. And I was watching it thinking to myself in my little amateur editing brain, I bet you I could just take out that first scene and cut directly from the first one into the second one and leave out that 20 minutes and you wouldn't even notice. I'd say you could. You probably could. I think you could. No good. No I'd use. i you could. Can't recommend. No good. No use. Can't recommend. Oh, well, that's that's a shame, Michael. Mm. Should, should, we, should we move on, Michael, to something that I think we can both recommend? All right. What is it? Yeah. Bloody, Michael, you and I have had uh, have had a good old time looking at the Marvel TV shows, Michael. I've enjoyed And we've come up, we've come up with fun little... Fun little kind of nom de guerres for them. Some people uh, say that, one yes. Of them, one of them was called The Audacity. Yeah. The other was called The Timidity. Yeah. And then the last one was called The Fuckery. Yes. Michael, I would like to posit that for this particular review, we should mix The Audacity and The Fuckery together to make The Fadacity. The Fadacity. Not The Fucking Audacity. <laughs> no. No. That would be too sensible. The Fuckery and Audacity, Michael. Benjamin, are you talking about 2021's James Gunn's DC's The Suicide Squad? Yes. Benjamin. What the fuck? I went to see this film, 2021's James Gunn's DC's The Suicide Squad, in the yeah. cinema, believe it or not, of all places. Get out of town. It was very... I did. I had to go out of town, Ben. I went to the suburbs. Oh, you went to the suburbs, Michael? Which cinema suburb. did you go to see it I in? I went to Blanchardstown because that was the only one that was open and Get showing it and the had fuck seats. fuck out of town. I did, Ben. I got right out of town. <laughs> I got into Dublin 15, into the Castleknock Blanchardstown area. And I saw it. I got lost, That's Ben. hilarious. I got lost. Yeah, I you did. Blanchardstown's amazed. Yeah, I got lost. I was wandering around a dark car park alone late at night and the security man had to help oh, me find right? the cinema. I was fine, Ben. I'm a big, tough man. Oh, so nothing good. happened to me. Good. But... It was a rare treat to see it in the cinema. And I was thinking, am I enjoying this so much because it's in the cinema or am I enjoying this so much because it's actually quite good? So I, I had a very similar experience, Michael, because I went to see it with my good lady friend here in Belfast. Michael. Right, right. Go on. Um, I, I went up to Belfast. To you got right film. out of town. <laughs> I got right out of town. And we went to see it in a lovely cinema here called The Strand. And it was it was just really nice to be back in the cinema, Michael. We're back, Ben. Just We're back in the cinema. We can do was, this podcast. It was, it was, it was a big screen and it was wonderfully socially distanced so it felt very safe mm. and we were sitting there and the two of us were having a great time and at at two points both of us were like um, is this great because it's great or is it great because we're just at the cinema it's nice to yeah. be out, out in the cinema don't know don't know Ben don't know, don't know. I haven't been able to distinguish those endorphins yet I, I think able to. I think it is great Ben I think it is what have been they've been throwing this at us for 18 months that this film is going to be the saviour of cinema we were told that about uh, Tenet we were told yes. that about A Quiet Place 2 Black Widow Wonder Woman and all of those things were going to save cinema and bring people back to the cinema but I think this through serendipity of timing vaccinations uh, ennui with being at home this seems to be doing very well in the cinemas also, just being an interesting film, Michael. That's what we talk about next. Um, so, Warner Brothers... I've heard of them. As far as I know, yeah. right, Warner Brothers have turned around to James Gunn and gone, look, we fucked it. Yeah. <laughs> Our cinematic universe isn't really a cinematic universe. Mm. <laughs> but you're quite good at this, apparently. Mm. Why don't you take Suicide Squad and fix it? And yeah. James Gunn went, because he knew he had them... By the balls. And he went, yeah, but you have to let me do whatever I want. Yes. And they went, yeah, fuck it. It can't get any worse. Yeah. Now, I would say there were probably one or two caveats to that, to be honest. Go on. But <laughs> Well, okay. Do you want to hear one or two of the caveats? The caveats are, are we doing, mild spoilers. Are we doing spoilers. spoilers yet? Yeah, these are mild spoilers. We're not getting into full spoilers. Okay. Because I but think we I could have said this a few weeks ago. And I'm not even going to say if the caveat is true or not. But there is no way when they said you can do whatever you want that they didn't say except kill off Harley Quinn. Yeah, fair. 
There is not Fair. a chance, they said, you can kill our cash cow in what we think will be a B-list film. Fair. So that, I imagine, was a caveat. And, One caveat. And I imagine the other caveats were, you're not touching Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, Flash. You're not having any of them in it. That's what yeah, I imagine. Across the board. You know, so there were caveats, I'm sure. But I'm, ba- I'm sure they basically told him, come up with whatever other characters you want and do whatever the hell you want. So what I what I found out trawling through Twitter, Michael, a- after this particular thing is, James Gunn has always been afraid of the villain, Starro. And we saw him in the trailer, so that's not really a spoiler at all. He's a big spooky um, starfish man. He's a big blue starfish man. He's always been terrified of him. And they had a big giant inflatable one at the London premiere, Michael. Oh, very good. Um, yeah, they had a big giant inflatable starro. Um, and so the the central conceit of this, Michael, is set in a small Central American nation. Corto Maltese. Corto Maltese, which is named after the famous... Maltese Falcon. You, you're, no, the European... Um, <laughs> the European comic book series. Um... Corto Maltese is a is a famous um, comic book character, okay, from Italian comics right. called Corto Maltese, and he's a pirate captain. Oh, cool. and so bizarrely, this island is called Corto Maltese. Very strange, and it's a weird nod to <laughs> to an Italian Euro comic. Hmm. Um, so that's also an interesting thing. Um, and uh, Michael, this just does a great job of what a government-sanctioned death squad would be. Yeah, um, maybe a bit more skilled. A bit more skilled. Because, uh, Michael, the, one of the caveats that James Gunn had was, you've got to let me put all my pals in it. Yeah. <laughs> all his pals are in it, Ben. All his pals are in it. So we have um, Nathan Fillion. He's one of his pals. As the, ta- the detachable kid. Yeah, TTK. D- TDK we have Michael Rooker yeah he's in it as Savant yeah he's on in there uh, David Dachman who appears in a couple of, That's of other uh, D- Dachman thank you um, he appears in it there as well he's been in a few James Gunn gigs Go on. over the years um, I'm trying to think of other ones now Taika Waititi's on Taika in Waititi, there Taika Waititi is best mate to Taika Waititi's in there twice um, Sylvester Stallone is in there is he Yes. Get out of town. I won't. Well, I was. I was where, in Blanchardstown then. Where was he hiding? Right, look, fuck it. Look, there's no way we can talk about this without talking okay, about spoilers. Okay, so hang on. So hang let's on. just okay, talk. Okay, let's you ready? Throw down the spoiler warning. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't want spoilers for Suicide Squad, don't listen to this pod. Do, though, because we need the listens, Ben. Benjamin. Come back. Um, what was I saying? Yeah. So that's just the really shark, Ben. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was Taika Waititi. No, that was the shark. Taika Waititi, Ben, he was the rat catcher one. Yes, he was the rat catcher one, but no. I thought he had doubled up. No, no, that in was a, in a so classic that's kind of... Get out of yeah, yeah. town. I won't. I was in Blanchardstown, Ben, but I'm back. That's another one of James Gunn's best mates. Yeah, yeah. He was also in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. He was, exactly. Sean that's Gunn is in it, Ben. Sean Gunn is in it twice. Twice, yeah. All he's his mates the weasel are there. and he's the calendar man? I think it was calendar man, yeah. For so half he, a second. He might come back briefly in the future. Very good. So, yeah. Um, Michael, this film is the Mad Libs of <laughs> screenwriting. Yes. They had one lottery ball machine with 70s Silver Age characters yeah. and villains. They had another one <laughs> with unusual story beats. Mm. And then they had another one of Suicide Squad 2015 things that we want to make, take the piss out of. Yes. And that is my favourite aspect of it, Ben. When we left, I said to your friend and mine, Shane, I said to him, or maybe it was Jim, I said to one of them, this was like if the first one had been good. Yes. <laughs> this Correct. Is, this is basically... What we thought, what we thought and hoped and prayed that the first one would be, is what this yes. one was. That and is, it's not to say it's with, it's not without its flaws, Ben. It does have flaws. Oh, it, indeed, Michael. No film is without flaw, e- except Ben. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Um, Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane. Yeah, that's perfect. Fucking rosebud. It was a sled the whole time. Anyway, um, <laughs> what? Well, it's not without its flaws, but. It is exactly what you would hope for in a Suicide Squad film. Benjamin, 
The yeah. fanboys and girls loved the animated uh, film Bat- uh, Suicide Squad Assault on Arkham. Is that what it was called? Yeah, that's a that's a big popular one. Very popular one. Quite good. Nowhere near as good as this. Nowhere near as good as this. This was a great film this from top to bottom, Michael. Absolutely fantastic film. Not suitable for children. Ultra violent. Ultra violent. Yeah. Ultra gross. There's willies in it. There's boobies in it. There's boobies There's in it. There's a Michael. willy and a booby. Yeah, you get my, two. I was I told this to my girlfriend, Ben, and she said, you're a 38-year-old man. Please stop saying the words willy and booby, but I won't. I mean, she has a point. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> but I'll still um, keep saying willy and booby. Um which is very surprising, but not surprising when you realise it's James Gunn. This is a James Gunn trauma film. films, massive high budget DC movie. Yeah, this this is my favourite DC movie, Ben, ever. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. This goes up in my top three of superhero films of all time, Michael. I'm sorry, this has trumped several Marvel films. Don't for me. you say sorry to me. I um. don't know <laughs> if it will stay there. But it is probably my favourite film of this year, at least, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's my favourite superhero film since Endgame. Yep. Easily. Yep. Uh, It's way better than anything Marvel have done since Endgame. Oh, yes. Isn't that interesting? Was Far From Home after Endgame? It was Far From... Far From Home was not as... No, this Mm. is better than Far From Home. Ah. It's different from Far From Home. I've only seen this once. I've seen Far From Home multiple times. I think, Michael, one of the very interesting things about this is it looks at that formulaic approach to superhero films that Marvel is honing mm. and kind of just goes, fuck you. Yeah, there's swearing that in shit, this, there's willies. That shit's boring. There's boobies. <laughs> um, that shit's boring. You take yourselves uh, too, uh, too, you're, you're going for too many high moments mm. and you don't need that many high moments. You need one or two hero moments. But that's it. Then mm. you can just have fun. Yes. You can just play around with it. So <clears throat> in this film, Michael, what we see is uh, the Suicide Squad has to go and basically stop whatever the beast of Corto Maltese is. Mm. Um, in the end, it turns out to be Starro. Um, Starro the Conqueror, who's a famous 70s um, Silver Age nightmare fuel. Um, and he's a classic villain of of the... Oh no, he's actually... Sorry, I take that back. He's Golden Age. Yeah, he's pretty um, old. He's, he's one of the original villains that the Justice League fought. I think the first um, Is he the first? Is he their so, Hulk? Yeah. He's their Hulk. Okay. Um, so he's he's like DC, you know, royalty at, at, a cer- at a certain level. And what we see, Michael, is first of all, it takes everything about the original Suicide Squad and it just makes it better. So it's we don't better. have to, sp- yeah, we don't have to spend hours and hours and hours with Amanda Waller. Yes. Um, and we don't have to see her weird, angry outbursts all the time. Yes. And when we do get involved with her weird angry outbursts it it's given a little knock on the head very literally <laughs> can we talk about that for a second because that yeah. to me was the key to that whole film essential it was absolutely fucking essential and all credit to james gunn viola especially viola davis to play it the way she did yeah it really that scene makes up for the first one because you end up watching the first one and hating Amanda Waller and not in an interesting way you hate her because she's presented as the one who has to get things done she's the Nick Fury of the DC universe and you know she's got her methods but by god she gets it done and by the end of it you despise her and having her like having her own team question her throughout this and then not her execute them and them all being terrified of her, but to just smack her in the head with a golf club and fix it. Was this woman's mentally unwell. Yeah. <laughs> and very clever to have the person who smacks her over the head with the golf club be the only other slightly older woman of colour in the room. Oh, yes, because she just assumes the role immediately. Very good. Very clever. Dale, get, get the map up, you dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> get back on the satellites, um, you douchebag, or something like that. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that is... My probably favourite moment of the whole film. Yeah, it's it's really solid. Um, I think Sebastian the Rat was the, the steal for me. But, um, Michael, then we get to see a couple of other... Um, little fuck use to David Ayer's Suicide Squad um, poor old Captain Boomerang yeah I can imagine that good old Jai Courtney probably was pretty happy with that to be honest 
I think Joy Courtney had a, I, I, I say fair fucks to Joy Courtney for coming back and being like yeah just take me out in the first 10 minutes it's funnily grand. enough Joy Courtney died in almost the exact same position that he died in Spartacus Blood and Sand I wonder if that was a reference or it was a coincidence very possibly is mm. Michael mm. very possibly is. knowing James Gunn you could have layers on layers on layers There's here so Michael. many layers we don't know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we got uh, Harley Quinn and Rick Flagg, who were the only other two um, kind of legacy characters from the 2015 one. Um, I think this is Harley Quinn's swan song because Margot Robbie has said she's no longer interested in, in playing that character. Now, is that, a, is that a pay me more money Warner Brothers mm. move? Or is it a, I, I think I should probably leave this character behind now? Mm, possibly. Um, because it certainly got her her start, but she's gone on to do her own thing. She now has her own huge production company that makes quite a few films. She's doing fine. Um, don't worry about she's it. She's doing fine. So I don't I don't think she maybe feels she has to play that character, which is occasionally very exploitative. Not in this film. Not in this. But not, in other films. Not for a long time, to be fair. Not in this or um, Birds of Prey. Or Birds of Prey, yeah. Um, and I think that monologue that she has with the, the would-be despot um, about how he's a bad person and if, you know... If if you're my type of man, then it's best to put a bullet in you now, mm. um, because the cruelty that you have, is, I think that's a very clear kind of. I've grown as a character. Get to fuck. Probably could have killed her off. Probably could have killed her off if mm. Warner Brothers hadn't said no. We're going to give her more money and yeah, hope yeah. she comes back. I um, felt Ben that the two points where it sagged. You've segued us nicely into that. One of them on. was the the Harley Quinns. I thought the Harley Quinn scenes were a weak point. Um, oh, that's I, interesting. I thought, particularly her escape, wasn't terribly exciting, and I enjoyed it for the, the sheer Terminator esque quality. Of it. The, the escape, uh, I felt it sagged a little bit there, and I also think it sagged a little bit in the bar scene and the subsequent escape from the van. That's interesting because I um, there are two beats that aren't necessary, mm. um, and. I, I think that's James Gunn just playing around with what he enjoys doing, which is making kind of madcap, yeah, yeah, yeah. silly moments. I, I think, I think what's interesting about the car scene, the you know the the drive away, is watching the three men at the top of their game. Do you mm. know what I mean? As as, I, I think it's fun to watch Idris Elba, Joel Kinnaman, and John Cena have at like. Um, Was John Cena in it? Yes, John Cena was in it. He's very hard to see, I Michael. Didn't, I didn't see him. <laughs> That's why he had the big beacon on his head, Ben, so you could see him. But it was nothing to do with the character. It was to do with being able shining, to see John Cena. It's a shining beacon of liberty. Benjamin. Um, yeah. Idris Elba was a, an absolute fucking star in this. He was absolutely brilliant. Him and John Cena steal that movie. Absolutely 100%. Um, my favorite the shark is great but in terms of enjoyable things oh do you know what if i was will smith i'd be pissed off because a man <laughs> came in and did your job 20 times better yeah um one of the things i love michael is the scene in the rebel camp where the two of them are keeping score it's kind of a very it's a very legolas and gimli lord of the rings moment except they're killing um, the goodies they're killing the goodies and that's the great little mini twist at the mm. end. It's like, why haven't my men alerted me to your presence? Mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, we're very good at our jobs. Mm. Um, watching them, the special effects for Bloodsport, Michael. Mm. Bloody great. Excellent. I enjoyed his kit. Yeah. I enjoyed the limitations of his powers because once he runs out of little... Thingies, uh, bloody, blood sports, uh, let's call them. What, what do you got? Modular components for his stuff. That's it. Yeah. He's, he's stuck. Yeah. Um, Oh, loved it all, Michael. That little count. Him and John Cena have this fantastic rivalry. Yes. Um, Viola Davis takes the piss out of all three of those characters, Deadshot, Bloodsport, and and Peacemaker, by saying, in his hands, anything could be a weapon. Yeah. That's her exact speech from the original Suicide Squad. Very good. Raised <laughs> and by his father. Like, from, yeah, very funny. Yeah. Uh, the and fact... they invert that so often with Bloodsport, Michael, because he's not a good dad. There's no emotion in the scene in the prison where he's like, God fucking damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you get caught stealing a watch? And it's like, it's... it's Oh, it's a, a great little fuck you to Will Smith. <laughs> I don't think it was necessarily a fuck you to Will Smith. I mean, it, I think it, I think it has come out in the wash that he was recast as Deadshot originally. Yeah, I, and I then think they that's decided true. to rewrite it, not to do, not to not do Will Smith a disservice, and not to not do Idris Elba a disservice, but to be able to have Deadshot come back eventually. Oh, okay, so that you think Will, Sm Will Smith's going to do a return? He could do, and you know, it would be interesting to have them in the same film again. I would love for the next one to just be David Ayer 
to remake the original. There's nothing that they couldn't just remake the original, but better. So David Ayer, in response to this, Michael, I don't know if you saw what he released this week. Go on. Um, he released a very, uh, uh, a very. Uh, first of all, Suicide Squad, the original 2015, is having a Netflix resurgence at the minute because everybody's watching it in preparation for yes for this, this one because people are laboring under the notion that they need to see the first one, you, you very but much you don't. don't. No, you very much you very don't. much don't. They've gone out of their way to ensure that that's not the case. Um. But he released a thing about the air cut and he said, my original film was fantastic and da 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 And like really like singing his own praises and the praises of his original cast and stuff like that. Um, and then he said, but I won't be talking about this publicly anymore. Yeah, we'll see it in a few years, do. Ben. Um, we'll see it in a few years. They'll release the air cut in a few years. Um, but it was just interesting to see that kind of response um, in response. Because I suppose for David Ayer, it must, it must chap his buns somewhat that people are just loving this michael it has like a 92 percent rating on rotten tomatoes or something it's so good it's so good and it's, it's, so it's good. because it's fun yeah it's just fun and for the first time we're getting an r-rated superhero film mm. i don't think this level of gore or silliness has been attempted before ah. i mean i know we've had we've had deadpool, deadpool. and we've had things but they don't it's not the same ah. this is a whole I'm sorry. This is a whole ah. other level of aggression and oh, yeah. gore. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a, it's it's way beyond Deadpool. Dead, that's not to say Deadpool. Deadpool is quite R-rated. Though. Juggernaut does rip him in half quite graphic. Yeah, um, but, and, you but know, this just keeps of, doing it. Yeah, there there are willies poor, in Deadpool as well. Poor Pete Davidson. <laughs> Serves him right, though. He sold them out. He sold him out. He's no good. Yeah. So th- I, I suppose just to, to finish this up, Michael, wrap it up, I think this wrap is going to be a Suicide Squad episode. But anyway, just to finish this up, there are two particular scenes that stand out to me as as something very different. First of all, the way James Gunn plays with our expectations with the initial squad. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they just get obliterated, yeah. Michael. Um, it shows Amanda Waller in a fantastic light because she's even willing to sacrifice Rick Flagg. I actually disagree with that. I think that's a plot hole. Because um, because that yeah. that scene, assuming that Rick Flag has been sent in with them, knowing that they're the distraction, Rick Flag is not a Suicide Squad member. He's Rick's a fl- US. He's, he's a highly he decorated US bomb, Marine. Yeah, he doesn't have the bomb in his head. He's not in prison, so it doesn't make sense to send Rick Flag in, not knowing that that he's on the Suicide Squad. Yes, the 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 bait. Yeah, that, for the bait that and switch didn't make sense to me. Um, so there's that interesting moment there um, and it plays with that expectation because we've invested in these through all the advertising and the campaign and stuff like mm-hmm. that and it's a typical James going move to then be like <laughs> yeah. uh, nope um, as soon as it was Nathan Fillion and Michael Rooker though if you've seen any James Gunn movies you know they're dead yeah you know they're not going to make it they're mm-hmm. not They're not making it out of this but um, the other scene that really disturbed me Michael was the Starro experimentation scene yeah very unpleasant with Peter Capaldi mm. so unpleasant Michael mm. Like, ugh. What really disturbed, my stomach turned. What really disturbed me, Ben, was someone who made that movie hates birds. Yeah, what was that about? What was all the bird killing? Why Why do they not like birds? I don't know. I don't know. Because I was on edge about Sebastian being killed the whole time. And ben Oh, I didn't I, want Sebastian to go anywhere. No, no, you can check out the film. Does the, the website Does the Dog Die? And you can find out that, in fact, Sebastian doesn't, which is a great relief. But the, hey, he's on Bloodsport's knee at the end. He yeah, he's pets. fine. Everything's fine. Everything's grand and everything's, everything's fine. fine. Idris Elba's great, though. The little Idris squeal Elba's having he does the time of his life. Rats. Oh, my yeah. God. Just brilliant. Anyway, Ben, we better move on because we've got other things to talk about. Michael, we've, we've, run, we've run out of time, Michael, basically. But anyway. Um, we've Michael, got 25 minutes. Last great film. Go yes. watch it. We do not have 25 minutes. We do. Get out we of do. New episodes sometimes go to an hour and 15. Just go, I have just, stuff to do with my just, life. Just go with it. Just go with it. Michael, um, I put this one on the on the block um, a while back there um, because I'm quite into this concept of flanderization, Michael. Mm, what does that mean? Flanderization, Michael, is a term that was born from The Simpsons, like many pop culture terms. Mm. Um, born from The Simpsons, Michael. Like it's funny, and but it's, it's to do because with because it's true. It's funny because it's true. Um, which is, um, it's born from The Simpsons, Michael, from one Nedward Flanders. I've heard of him. Yeah, so initially when he was introduced, Michael, he's basically a foil for Homer Simpson in that he's a good neighbour. Yeah. Um, now, that isn't to say um, that there isn't a Christian leaning to him. There is, but the the whole point of that character is that he's a good, all-American neighbour 
Um, you know, he'll lend Homer his gardening supplies. He'll check in. He'll, you know, he'll try and have a casual chat with him just he'll, to be neighborly. He'll do things um, for the good of the community. He'll do things for the good of the community. And it's not because he's trying to show Homer up. It's simply because he's a nice guy. Yeah, he's got a lovely he's relationship a nice guy. with his wife and two well-adjusted kids. And somewhere between that, Michael, came the shift of ultra orthodox or not ultra orthodox because that's a whole different kettle of fish but an ultra conservative christian anti-vaxxer he, um, is he an anti-vaxxer he's an anti-vaxxer there's a scene in it um there's a scene in the early simpsons episode where he's like and aren't you glad now that we didn't get inoculation kids oh and it pans to what are the names of the kids rod and todd Rod and Todd and Rod and Todd are like under a blanket and they're really pale and they're like <laughs> um because they've got some easily inoculated against disease. COVID-19 um, probably. So there's a lot of that going around and then he becomes the Ned Flanders that we all know now where he's like turn to the lord diddly do. Mm. Um yeah. And this this became known as as flanderization Michael and it's the gradual process of quirks in a character. Yes devouring the realistic elements of that character mm. um so this is painfully common uh michael in animated tv shows and in sitcoms yes um because someone will graduate to the level of a fan favorite mm-hmm. and then the writers will try and hone in often to the wrong degree yes on what fans like about that character mm. um so we see it happen multiple times. I suppose one of the earliest examples that we might have in a live action sitcom is Kramer from um Kramer from Seinfeld. Um right, go on. when he started, he's an odd guy. Yes. Um and he has quirks that make him kind of funny to have in a scene with Jerry Elaine and George. But then, Michael, he becomes batshit crazy um as the seasons progress. He's this insane man who will stop at no lengths to do you know whatever he feels like doing that particular week um yeah the thing about it is though yeah okay you're saying kramer is one of the earliest examples i don't think he is to be honest because i think that as long as there have been sitcoms this process which i suppose never had a name until flanderization Mm. Uh, and it's also funny because flanders isn't the most flanderized character on the simpsons which is hilarious because you know, arguably it's, Homer is. Well, Homer is. Homer, even the show itself said Homer seems to get stupider every year. Like, yeah. Homer used to be a kind of slightly below intelli- average intelligence um, dad who tried his best. And then by, by, by the bad years, he's a complete and utter idiot who borderline can't read. And yeah. can't use computers, can't read, doesn't understand society is horribly abusive to a family. But that is true of almost every sitcom character of all time. Look yeah. look at um the Big Bang Theory. Sheldon Ugh. went from uh from a like a, a an intellectual college professor with some quirks to his quirks were his character. Yeah. Um look at um Name a flipping sitcom man. even the best sitcoms of all time. Friends. Even fr- oh, okay friends Joey. is the best Every character on Friends except Rachel. Monica yes. started out. Monica at the start of Friends is the kind of rational, reasonable one. Yeah. And by the end of it, her her OCD, her cleaning compulsion, um, have she's just, just over- shrill and irritating. Yes, she's just awful. Uh, Chandler was the funny one who had a bit of a dark past, and by the end, he's like he can't even have a human conversation. Um, without being a sarcastic. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Joey started as a bit of a ditz, and by the end of it, he's practically Homer level dumb, where you know he can yeah. barely read. Every Ross single... started out as the guy next door and then became an abuser. Like it's a whole thing. It's, I wouldn't even say that with, an awful person. I wouldn't say that with Ross. Ross's defining thing is he becomes such a fucking loser. He <laughs> yes. like he starts as a bit down on his look, but everything just constantly goes wrong for him to the point of he can't even get dressed in the morning without fucking it up. Yeah. <laughs> but even, like, even the best sitcom of all time, Ben, Arrested Development, does this. And it happens in sitcoms because sitcoms have to take the funny route. So if someone does something yeah. that's funny, funniness in sitcoms is more important than character development or plot. So... I think in sitcoms, you just have to accept that this is what happens in long-running serialized sitcoms. 
Yeah, it's you an could, inevitable consequence, yeah. It's an inevitable complex of the American way of doing sitcoms. Yes. It doesn't happen in British sitcoms. Because Can you give me an example? Uh Faulty Towers. He's Because they start as <laughs> he starts as an awful prick and he finishes as an awful prick. Yeah. Um Father Ted, you could argue. Dougal is a complete moron from episode one. He's but no more or less of a moron. moron. Yeah. <laughs> but British sitcoms, and I know we'll get some flack from calling Father Ted a British sitcom, but it was written and produced by English people. Um what are um maybe not written produced. Um <laughs> What are we saying? They're so short. So they yeah. don't have the ser- they don't have the yeah. time to go down that route so badly. So yeah. I would say when we're talking about this, you can basically forget about sitcoms because with sitcoms it's inevitable. Well that's good, Michael, because the majority of my list is not sitcom based. Good. Good. Because <laughs> uh, I've gone out of my way to avoid that, Michael. Good. Um because they are the most common examples and we've seen them all over the place. Mm. But to look at a probably a, an example that almost anyone who listens to this will be able to pick up on, Jack Sparrow is a great example of the flanderization process in full swing. Right, go on. Um so when we meet Jack Sparrow, mm. yes, he's incompetent, but his incompetence is is born of Almost an intentional deceit of people. Yes. The the the, the core of Jack Car- uh, the core of Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse, uh, of, the Black the Curse of the Black Pearl, is that he is very very clever and tricky and clever and tricky and clever. Mm. He's deceitful and tricky and clever. Mm. And part of that is the character of the fool that he plays, mm. and that is famously kind of famously kind of exhibited. In his exchange with Barbosa, where he says, "An honest man, you can always trust to be honest. Uh, mm. Dishonest man," and it, it, that kind of linguistic dexterity is there to throw people off, and he constantly takes advantage of people underestimating him. Yes, that's what he does, um, and he's also incredibly competent. When he fights with a sword, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's a very good swordsman. Usually wins. He, he usually wins. If it ends up in a sword battle, he's very, very capable. And what we see then, Michael, um, is diminishing returns in every sequel from there until we get to Dead Men Tell No Tales. Where's all the mermaids? Where's all the mermaids? Where Jack Sparrow is an absolute buffoon. He's a fucking nincompoop, Ben. He's a nink. He's a nuisance. Yeah. He's he's this bizarre, staggering, bumbling thing. He's a hindrance to the fucking is the plot of his own film. Yeah, he runs away from everything. He's an absolute coward all of a sudden. Um, there is no redeeming quality to that character by the end. He's just a bit of a twat. Mm, he's a big buffoon, Ben. And what happened was, ja- um, Johnny Depp brought all those wonderful quirks to the original character. Mm-hmm. And I think Disney might have expected people to really like that about him. Well, and they, they said, go on, crank that up there. See what happens. See I, what happens. I don't think that is it because I think it's oh, very on. rarely a conscious decision. Sometimes it oh, is, obviously. On. But it's writers are fallible people too. And the writers, mm. you know, the writers are sitting in the cinema watching people watching their movie. And it's like Pavlov's dog, Ben. They see something getting a good reaction and say, oh, people like that. Let's give them more of that. Yeah, and initially, then, like Pavlov's Pavlov dogs, Ben, it it gets even, an even better response. Like the the first time you do it, it's like, oh, that was a fun quirk. I'd love to see him do that again. Then the next movie, you have him do it twice, and it's like, oh, that's brilliant. I love when Jack Sparrow does the thing where he runs and goes. <laughs> and then the four, by the time you reach the fifth movie, it's just him running around going, <laughs> and everyone's going, oh, is that the Jack Sparrow we loved? That's not as good as it was last time. Mm, exactly. <laughs> um, and that becomes the big problem um, because it, it, it breaks the character, but it also turns them very two-dimensional. Mm. And then what you have is a two-dimensional character in a three-dimensional film and their interactions with other more grounded characters becomes very difficult mm. because they're not really a human character anymore and we've lost sight of their motivation. In the initial Pirates of the Caribbean, Jack Sparrow is very, very, very emotionally wounded by the betrayal of his crew where they stole his ship. Mm. Fundamentally, he's hurting from the fact that he used to be a captain 
Indeed and he not. isn't anymore. Yes. And he's a very prideful man. And he can't let go of the fact that it's like a captain without a ship. And he's like, well, I'm a captain. I'm a bloody captain. Um, You're the worst and they, pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Um, and there's there's lots of that, you know, in there. And it makes him a very compelling character. And that slowly gets eroded away as the series And then he's just running around going, oh! Yeah, and he's just a yeah, he's just a buffoon. Um, there are other examples of that, Michael, and this this wounds my heart to say. But Batman is a great example of yes. of kind of a very subtle flanderization. Go on, um, Batman in comic the last book Batman. comic book Batman. You could also argue it in the Dark Knight trilogy. Go on. Um, you know, comic book Batman has experienced that on two levels, Michael. We've had God Batman, and mm. then we have Grim Batman. Um, and what we get is, you know, the God Batman is a Grant Morrison invention. The Batman who plans for everything, mm. every eventuality, never surprised, always a backup plan, you know. Um, and it just makes it a very dull character because, you know, everybody always says who'd win in a fight, Batman or Superman. Everyone says Batman because he'd plan, he'd have yeah. a plan, he'd no, have a plan. No, no, Superman can move him. in the blink of an eye. Like, yeah, just kill him. Just decapitate him. Like, done. It's over. Superman but, wouldn't, though. Uh, Superman wouldn't though, but like if he was up against anybody else, yeah, you know, like Dark Side versus Batman isn't a fight. Um, do you know what I mean? It's it, it's it's not going to shake out in any particular way. But the flanderization of that character is God Batman. But I think the, the more kind of egregious flanderization of Batman is I'm Batman. Go on. Um, and it's it's the bit I am vengeance. I am the night. I am Batman. And it's that very over the top kind of vaudeville Batman that we see in the hands of certain writers. Um, I think a good example of that would be um, uh, oh, Tom King's Batman. My friend Tom King. Not your friend Tom King. Um, Tom King's Batman. Tom King's Batman is, a, is, is basically Frank Miller's Batman a few steps before he goes full Frank Miller. Right. Um, and that grim and broody Batman came from Frank Miller. Frank Miller designed the Dark Knight. And the Dark Knight is this big, stocky, has to be extra violent because he's old now and he can't afford to give any leeway mm. in a fight. And that character is supposed to be a pastiche of, you know, ultra conservative methods of keep, keeping the law. And it's like it's almost like if Ju Judge Dredd became Batman. Mm, Judge Batman. Judge Batman. Benjamin. But people have taken the wrong part from it. <laughs> Here's where I'm going to slightly disagree with you. You can disagree with me as much as you want, Michael. We have I, a podcast can, for I, exactly that purpose. I can and I will. And I actually don't think Batman's a great example. Because, okay. and here's why. Go on. Because, unlike some of the examples we've talked about before, if you're not happy with one interpretation of Batman, you go and pick up a comic and you, <laughs> there's true. another Batman going on at the same time. So one writer can be doing um, grim, dark, you know, tough brawler Batman who's in minimum armor and, you know, he gets by on his toughness and his wits. Yeah. And then another writer at the same time can be doing high tech planning preparation Batman. And Iron then Man another Batman. writer at the same time can be doing cosmic level super genius can take out all of the new gods at the same time because he's prepared enough Batman and at the same time another writer can be doing slightly older Batman who has to pass over the mantle to Dick Grayson because his leg is sore and oh, they can, my leg. Oh, my leg. Dick, will you will you Batman tonight? I've got a sore leg. And so I thought you were in space, kill, defeating oh, all the new me. gods with planning. It's my sciatica. <laughs> yeah, it's my, my sciatica, Dick. I'm 38, Dick. <laughs> my back hurts. It's very sore. Should, shouldn't have done this. Yeah. I forgot oh, that man. your body keeps count. <laughs> so you know what I mean? That's the thing about, yeah. like, Batman hasn't so much been flanderized as he's like a teardrop. And the original concept of Batman has just dropped down and hit the page and every aspect of him has splashed off and made new versions who are barely the same character. That's very poetic of you. I, I, I actually thought it was quite poetic <laughs> as I was saying it. Was like, it'd make That's, a good graphic, wouldn't it? It, was, it would. That'd where be all the graphic. splashes that were, were different. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to be that poetic. But that's that what's happened with Batman, Ben. As opposed to one of my least favourite flanderizations of the last few years has Go been on. the movie version of Drax. Yes. Because in, in Guardians of the Galaxy 1, Ben, 
Drax was very much praised for being a competent, capable, intelligent character who didn't understand metaphor or human social situations. That was the joke. That's the joke. Very confident, very capable, he just doesn't get idiom. There's some sort of linguistic difference that makes it hard for him to relate to people speaking that way. Yeah. And by the time Endgame rolls around, not Endgame, he's barely in Endgame, by the time Infinity War rolls around, he's a complete fucking idiot. Yeah, he gets homerified. He gets absolutely homerified. He's trying to stay so still, eating nuts that no one can see him. Why? What's that about? Where did this buffoon come from? How could this guy be feared across the galaxy? As the destroyer, when yeah. he's an absolute buffoon. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier then. When you have more real grounded characters, which is a funny thing to say about Doctor Stephen Strange. But when yeah. you have more, when you have Doctor Strange, Spider-Man and Iron, Iron Man, Man interacting with him, it almost doesn't work. It only works because it's very well written and performed. Yeah. But it's so close to not working. And they keep it incredibly brief. Because you couldn't have had more than a single scene with trying to have Drax and Mantis, but especially Drax, interacting with real characters. Because yeah. he's such a buffoon. He really is. And, and it's, it's going it's... to be a real challenge in the next Guardians of the Galaxy to pull that back. And I think that's why Dave Bautista's fed up playing him. I, I think, yeah, because Dave Bautista has said pretty much that he's not really interested in pursuing this yeah, a lot longer. Yeah, he's an um, absolute buffoon. He has been, one dimensional part of his character has been taken and blown out into his entire character. Yeah. It's, it's not like the Batman thing. I mean, no, okay, because there are Because you can't pick up another version. Exactly. Yeah. You can go back and watch Guardians of the Galaxy again. We say this all the time on this podcast that changes and developments in the character don't stop you from going back and enjoying the one you enjoyed. Yeah. But this character has taken a linear route towards buffoonery. Yeah. Which is the name of this episode. A linear route towards buffoonery. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 um, I quite like that. Uh, yeah. You're so very that, poetic today. I don't book. know what's wrong with me, Ben. I'm a poet and yeah. I don't even bloody realise. <laughs> um, Trope averted, Ben. Yeah. Benjamin, um, are there yes. any others we want to talk about? We've got about six minutes left. So I, I think it's interesting that you said it's going to be very hard to pull that back, Michael, because I think what we're witnessing in the current pop culture landscape... What a fucking segue, Ben. <laughs> ...is the possibility of pulling it back. So mm. one of the things that's happened with... Benjamin, with, like yes. the foreskin of pop culture. Like, oh. <laughs> oh. Pull um, it back. Give it a wash. It, well, you should give it a wash, ladies and gentlemen. That's yeah. just good. That's just good, good hygiene. hygiene. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> Michael, Rick and Morty, when it started out, became a, an instant cult classic. Mm. An instant um, kind of draw for people. It was new. It was different. It was funny. It was irreverent. You know, it had everything that you needed. And then season one grabbed everybody season two grabbed everybody and then season three and four came along and i remember it being a a, a moment where my interest in the show dropped mm. off started um, to wane because what happened was that the character of rick um stopped growing um and simply became a god yes and it didn't matter what happened Rick would deal with it in approximately two seconds. Yes. And the way they used to build tension in an episode is they would have Rick or Summer or Jerry or Beth run into a situation where Rick wasn't available. Mm -hmm. Something would happen. Yes. And then Rick would become available and would fix it. Yes. One Occasionally, of the they just Ben was the a superhero episode. Yeah, so they, they had their Guardians of the Galaxy pastiche. What are they called again? I can't remember. The, the Avengers. They're getting their own spin-off, which really annoys me. Um, They're getting their own spin-off series. The Defenders of the Galaxy, whatever they are. And he's just better than all of them. Mm. At he's everything. just everything. At everything. In his sleep. He's he's the, the ultimate villain. He takes out their version of Thanos in two minutes. Um, do you know what I mean? And... It, it's it's ridiculous and it makes you stop investing in the character and it was flanderization they took that superior smug attitude that people enjoyed mm. um because it's funny to watch that kind of be like no i don't care about you or your opinion yeah and they and pushed it to consider an, yourself a rick it's funny to consider yourself a rick even though anybody that ever does that is 
a quintessentially a Jerry. Yeah. Um, but anyway, now, Michael, in season five, they're pulling it back. Very much so. They're, they, are, they are hauling it back. Like the foreskin um, of pop culture, Ben. Like the foreskin of pop culture. Jesus Christ. Um, but they're hauling it back, Michael. The latest episode saw the return of the President of the United States. Yes. And in the initial time that we encounter Keith David as President of the United States, fantastic choice, well done. Um, Straight out of um, Saints Row. Yeah, Rick just makes a, a holy show of him. Mm-hmm. He's just this ridiculous, he's like, I'm better than all of you, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. And it's this whole thing. In this one, he's not. Mm. In this one, he gets caught with his pants down a little bit and he has to kind of work with the president to save the day. Very much the same in the episode with the Namor pastiche. The Namor pastiche. Uh, Mr. Nimbus. Mr. Mr. Nimbus. Nimbus. Mr. Um, Nimbus was the first character we've seen in a long time who was presented as a legitimate threat or rival to Rick. Yeah, no bother. No problem. No, not, um, um, not someone who thinks they're a threat or rival to Rick, but are actually trivial. And Rick... The, Acts like he is a legitimate threat as well. Yeah, he tries to do things civilly for a change. Yeah. Mm. And is and slightly doesn't... afraid. Yeah, because he's Mr. Nimbus. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's king of the oceans, Maury. Um, Allegedly, Ben, the Simpsons yeah. have also done this with Flanders, funnily enough. Have they now? Yeah, no, I haven't seen a Simpsons episode in about 10 years, but apparently Flanders has become, since he became the trope namer of this trope and very mm. famous for it, they pulled him back and he's a more rounded developed character now and he's not oh, just well, about good, the Bible anymore. Oh, well, good for him. Mm. Um, so it is possible to do this. It is possible to take Flanderization and it possibly adds to the enjoyment, Michael. I'm enjoying season five of Rick and Morty. We haven't talked about it much, but I watch it every Monday. I'm enjoying the stories where Rick kind of fucks it sometimes. Yeah. And he gets a um, bit of humility. And, a bit and he of, gets a bit of humility. Because he, it helps him to grow as a character. So hopefully, Michael, in the future, we can see a, a Drax return. I don't know, because if you lose the actor in live action, if you lose the actor, then the next yeah. representation is going to be totally different. Did they play Rick and Morty season five out of order, Ben? They did. Yeah. Uh, we got episode Giant seven before baby. five or six. Giant Space yeah. Baby. Uh, yeah. Benjamin. Yeah. There's some interesting um, examples of it where it actually works out well in the end. Do you want to hear go one on, or two of them go? on, give me, go. give me one or two of them, Michael. One of the most famous, Ben, and probably, maybe, maybe to the point where you would not even consider flanderization is Spock. Go on. Mr. Spock from Star Trek. Go on. Go back and watch season one of, season one of Star Trek, the original series, Ben, with Spock. No. Okay, don't. But if okay. you were to, you know what you'd see? What would I see? You'd see Spock making fun of people. You'd what? see Spock laughing and joking with the crew. You see Spock getting involved in physical tussles. Get out of town. And it was mostly, apparently, allegedly, this is Star Trek uh, uh, urban legend, but maybe it's documented somewhere. But it was mostly the influence of Leonard Nimoy wanting to focus in on these couple of quirks of Spock, like Mm. the logic and the lack of humour. And he was the one who said, no, no, this is not what Spock would do. Let's focus in on these traits. Oh, a little method acting. No, not method acting per se. That's not what method acting means. Yes, it is, Michael. It's a method to act. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but it was him who said, you know, let's not have Spock punch people. Let's have him do the Vulcan nerve pinch. Or let's not have Spock laugh along with all the rest of the crew. Let's have him stoically stand there. And that ended up making Spock a much more defined and interesting character, funnily yeah. enough. But then... They started doing that in everything in Star Trek and the next oh, generation no. the next generation is really responsible for a lot of flanderization, if you want to use yeah. that term. Not of characters but of races. For oh. example, uh the the focusing in on honor for the Klingons. Yeah. And then honor becoming the be all and end all of everything for Klingons. Their entire culture. Yeah. And it, I mean in the original series and the early days of the next generation, Klingons were sometimes sneaky. Klingons invented the cloaking device, Ben, in the original series. Get out of town. So the idea of them being sneaky was counter to the point of them being anyway, look, we will get to that another day. The other one is Deadpool, Ben. Go on. The flanderization of Deadpool created the Deadpool that we are now familiar with. Yeah, because the one that we got from Rob Leefield was a load of bloody awful. load of shite, Ben. He was just a rip-off of Wolverine. Deathstroke, but... Well, Deathstroke Deathstroke with Wolverine's powers. 
Yeah, Deathstroke Wolverine's powers, and he was a quick talking moany git that wanted yeah. to get laid. It was weird. Um, and then it was handed over to. Oh, I can't remember who got writers. to flanderize him. Another writer got to flanderize him, and that's the Deadpool we all know and love. Yeah, so sometimes it works out, is what I'm saying. Sometimes it works out just fine, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes. What do you think? Who oh, are your favourite Flanderized characters? By the way, I'm officially christening it Spocked It when Flanderization goes in the right way. Oh, they've Spocked It. Yes. Well, um, yeah, because it's not character development. It's not the character learning and growing. It's the writers or the actors figuring out a character and taking them a certain it's way. character honing, Michael. You know, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Um, they've whittled it down to the bare components, Michael. It's great. And they build it back up. And then they build it up, Buttercup. Exactly. Um, so... Ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? What do you think um, of Flanderized characters? What are the egregious examples you can think of? What are some of the great examples you can think mm. of? You can get in touch with us and let us know in a bunch of different ways. You can find us on the interwebs at www.shomrabeug.com. S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com. It means tiny room in Irish. You can find us on Instagram at Sure Look, Sure Listen Podcast. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Listen Sure. It means uh, Listen Sure in English. But but come here to me, come here to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. All of that pales yeah. in comparison to yeah, that Discord, on. baby. Get up, up on, on it. it. Hop up on it. Hop up on it. Imagine it's 1978, you're in a discotheque and someone tells you to hop up on that Discord, baby. Yeah, and you wouldn't you wouldn't say no. You no, wouldn't say no, you'd get person, up on that Discord, baby. Yeah, the person asking has flared trousers and potentially rollerblades. I mean, it's, it's what a time to be alive. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, join us in a week's time where we'll be talking about something, but we haven't decided that yet. We're going to have to do we? that off air. Uh, are we do, Are we going to do your superhero in different cultures? Oh, yeah, topic? let's do that. Yeah, let's let's do, that. do that. So we're going to take a look at the superhero through the lens of other cultures, mm. as opposed to the American-centric lens that we've become very familiar with. Very interesting and exciting, mm. I hope. <laughs> Benjamin. I think it's going to be a good episode, yes. If the listeners want to um, to get a jump start... Um, we're, we're, some of the things we're going to look at are uh, Major Grom, Plague Doctor. Okay. It's on Netflix. Um, mm. We're also going to take a look at Blood Red Sky on Netflix. And we're going to look at How I Became a Superhero on Netflix. Okay, that's a lot of Netflix. It's a lot of Netflix, Ben. But, you know, that is the most popular streaming service. And it's kind of the inspiration for this next week's episode. If Netflix would like to sponsor us, please do get in touch as well. Get you can touch get up us. on that Discord. We'll <laughs> fucking shill anything. Hop up on the Discord, Netflix, baby. And you know what, Disney Plus, if you want to sponsor us, we won't sue you in a couple of years' time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll just send that money straight to Scarlett Johansson, you stingy bastards. 